Tonight, we've got a very important uh, topic to talk about, and we're going to be talking tonight about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the impact on our freedoms. And I have two very distinguished people to help me navigate through this uh, very uh, sensitive but important topic as it impacts our freedoms from a number of perspectives. Um, tonight, I'm the national webinar host, uh, Greg Bonda, and of course, my very good colleague, David DeLima, who will also be joining me to help fill the questions and to make sure that everybody gets the opportunity to ask a question. I am very delighted to then say that our guest speakers tonight, Dr. David Ed Adler, who is the president of the Australian Jewish Association, um, and he's been very vocal in media and, of course, uh, very, very active in assuring that the, that the uh, Jewish voice is heard, both in Australia and internationally, of course. Then I have Senator Erica Betson, of course, Senator, there are not enough words for me to explain how important your role is and how, how, how supportive you have been of Family Voice Australia. So I do thank you for that. And uh, we look forward to your presentation because I know you have a close connection on this particular topic. So we look forward to your presentation as well. Um, as usual, sorry, as usual, what I'd like to do is just quickly uh, ask a very important uh, participant tonight, if I could have Rabbi Yankee Berger open up in prayer and commit this webinar to, to, the, um, to prayer so that we can get a better feel for it. That will be followed by my colleague, David DeLima, who will then also open up in a brief prayer as well. Could I pass over to you, please, Rabbi Yankee Berger? Yes, good evening, uh, Greg, and thank you once again for inviting me. Uh, let us begin with a prayer. There's no better book of prayer than the book of Psalms from King David. So we're going to begin with Psalm 122. I'm going to recite it in the original language of King David, the Holy Tongue, ancient Hebrew, and then we're going to recite it in English. the song of ascents by David. I was happy when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet were standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem that is built like a city, which all its builders are united together to make it beautiful. There the tribes went up, the tribes of God, as a testimony of Israel, to offer praise to the name of the Lord. For there stood the seats of justice, the thrones of the house of David. And therefore, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you have peace. May there be peace within your walls, serenity within your mansions. For the sake of my brethren and friends, I ask that there be peace within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord, I seek your well-being. You know, what is it about Jerusalem that we seek its welfare? What is it about Yerushalayim, the holy city? So we are taught that everything has a soul. Although we only see the interface, and that is the body, just like every human being has a soul, so too the world, the geographical space, has a soul. And the soul of the world is Yerushalayim, Jerusalem. So I'm now going to conclude with a special prayer for Jerusalem and for Israel. And this prayer we recite in our synagogue in Double Bay, where Dr. David Adler also today's uh, one of today's guest speakers he comes to pray every weekend in our synagogue so going to recite a special prayer uh, in in english mehu blesses abraham isaac and jacob bless the land of israel and reveal the glory of his kingship on the land promised to our ancestors please god may you deal graciously with its leaders and advisors to always lead them in justice and righteousness place in their hearts the ability to love fear and, sure, and serve you with truth and integrity. And may the words of our prophets be fulfilled. From Zion comes Torah, and from Jerusalem, the word of God. 
a father above grant peace to the land and eternal joy to its inhabitants. And return Israel to calm and tranquility without fear of terror. Spread your protective cover in all of the world. May this be, may this be your will. Let us say, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Very, very appropriate. And I'd like to hand over to David DeLima to bring us a short prayer as well. Thank you, David. Well, thank you, Greg, and thank you, Rabbi. Let us pray together. Master of the universe, we give thanks for your people, Israel, for their ancient foundations and for their modern restoration. We thank you that Israel stands as a beacon of democracy and freedom in a very turbulent part of the world. Mm. And we thank you for our nation of Australia for its wonderful role to enable the liberation of Bathsheba and then Jerusalem and indeed for the establishment of the modern Israeli state, as uh, even Doc Evatt, as president of the United Nations, provided uh, wonderful leadership there to the formation of the new nation. And we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Mm. We pray for good relations between Australia and Israel and that together we can bless the world as you have called all of those descendants of Abraham to bless the world. Amen. Amen. Thank you, David. Uh, I'm going to now go on to uh, introduce David Adler just once more, but just to put it in perspective, everybody, the topic tonight is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. For those that don't know, that's roughly the region. I'm sure David will have his own presentation, but just to put it into perspective, that's the region, the geography that we're talking about. And a bit more uh, vo um, clearer is that. So what I'd like to do is stop sharing now. I'll hand over to Dr. David Adler, President of the Australian Jewish Association. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you very much, Greg. And I just want to check that my screen share is on and people can, uh, can see this. There have been literally uh, libraries written on this subject of the uh, conflict between uh, the Jews and the Arabs, Israel, Palestine. So I'm just going to pick uh, little bits to hopefully give you an overview and uh, hopefully a bit of a better understanding. Um, here we go. So the person on the screen now is uh, Dennis Prager, the founder of Prager University. And he does these fireside chats when people ask him questions. And listen to his answer to one particular question. What is the root cause, the basic reasons that the Palestinians do not want Israel to exist? I-S-L-A-M. Because the traditional Muslim belief is that if a place has been under Muslim control, it can never revert to any other religious control. Uh, is, it doesn't matter. For most Palestinians, if Israel were as big as Brooklyn, they would still want it destroyed. There is no room for a non-Muslim sovereign state in the Middle East in most Palestinians' views. By the way, if it changes, there'll be peace in a week. The day Palestinians say we recognize the right of a Jewish state to exist in the Middle East, uh, there'll be peace in a week. Now, this may well be uh, a bit of an oversimplification, but it's certainly a major factor. And it's one, unfortunately, that is not politically correct to discuss and is one that's often avoided by uh, mainstream media and by many of our politicians as well. So uh, by opening in this way, you realize that if you're after standard political correctness, Greg, you've chosen the wrong presenter. Now, free debate. <laughs> so here's a little bit of an illustration. Um, and we have literally hundreds of examples like this of imams preaching violence. In this context, establishment of an Islamic state means in the land of Israel through to the rather extraordinary picture of a baby wrapped in bullets with machine guns and over the head of the baby uh, is the Quran. So anyone who wants to argue that religious motivation is not a major part of the um, conflict is actually disconnecting from reality. It is a major part, it's not the only part, but uh, let's have a look further. 
The other thing I want to uh, draw attention to is that um, the basis of the discussion we often have nowadays uh, is false. Um, the Palestinians as a people were actually invented in 1964 on the advice of the KGB. Um, the whole term uh, Palestine is a regional name that was uh, given to the area once the Romans con conquered it. Uh, it's a twist on the word Philistine, which meant invaders, the traditional biblical enemies of the Jews. Um, but if you go back prior to 1964, you will find no language, no currency, no record of involvement in any of the conflicts uh, using an identity of Palestinian. Now you can see here the flag um, is essentially the Jordanian flag without the star and the former King of Jordan uh, is basically saying that the truth is that Jordan is Palestine, Palestine is Jordan. And here is a rather long, longer description from an officer of the uh, PLO who acknowledges the Palestinian people does not exist. It's the, uh, the creation of a Palestinian state is only a means of continuing struggle against the state of Israel and to unite the Arab voices. Uh, and when you look at some of their uh, explanations repeatedly as to where they came from, here is Yasser Arafat saying, we are the descendants of the original Jebusites. Uh, then he says, we're the descendants of the Philistines. Uh, another um, Arab uh, leader, there is no Palestinian nation, never was, it's a colonial invention. Uh, another says similar, uh, it's common knowledge that Palestine is nothing but Southern Syria. But over the years, the, the narrative has changed uh, more and more. Uh, you can find no archeology, span nothing with a Palestinian identity uh, prior to the 1960s. Um, this contrasts with the actual history which has occurred in the area. And there is enormous uh, historical proofs of the Jewish presence going back to some 4,000 years. Um, if anyone visits Israel uh, in the foreseeable future, I'd encourage a visit particularly to Hebron and uh, the city of David where there is major archeology span uh, that just blows your mind going back in Hebron to the time of Abraham and in the city of David, uh, there's a lot that has been uh, found which demonstrates uh, the kingdom of David and Solomon uh, there were Jewish kingdoms for roughly 800 years before um, the exiles that were instigated by the Babylonians and then the Romans. There's a lot of evidence of the first and second temples in particular. Um, just a few historical pointers that uh, the armies of Muhammad uh, came in the seventh century and the Ottoman Empire, which uh, ruled for 400 years uh, until World War I. Uh, the British mandate uh, was in place until 1948. And of course, the modern state of Israel since 1948. Bit of important context and background. So when you look at the conflicts that have occurred, um, there has been a lot of conflict prior to the modern state of Israel. One of the big ones, which is well known, is the Hebron massacre of 1929, when the Arabs decided it was a good idea to uh, try to kill the Jewish population uh, of the ancient city of Hebron. And uh, it made worldwide news at the time. So if you want to say that the conflict is about uh, borders of a state, then you would be struggling to explain these sort of events. And there are a whole series of them. I've just picked out a few for this presentation. Unfortunately, we have seen an alignment between Arabs and uh, Nazism. Uh, there's the famous photo of the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, uh, Al-Husseini, 
uh, with Hitler himself. Um, the uh, Mein Kampf uh, is still a bestseller when translated into Arabic. And in the last year or two, um, we see these symbols uh, put up. The one on the left, the big uh, Nazi flag is close to Hebron in, a, in an Arab village. And the other one here where you see the two so-called Palestinian flags with the swastika here and here um, was on the border of Gaza. Um, so this starts to lead to an explanation of what the conflict uh, is about. None of this is about um, borders and land. Now, after the um, War of Independence for the establishment of the new state of Israel in 1948, um, Jordan did conquer completely the old city of Jerusalem. And they removed every single Jew. There was ethnic cleansing. Over 55 synagogues in the old city were damaged or destroyed. And this statement, uh, after uh, over a thousand years, not a single Jew remains in the Jewish quarter, not a single building, meaning Jewish building, remains intact. This makes the Jews return here impossible. Um, now, clearly events have, have proved that incorrect, thank God, but that was the objective of the conflict. Now, I have a, a very interesting strategic question, which is, um, the period between 1948 and 1967, uh, Arabs actually controlled uh, the Gaza Strip, um, Egypt controlled that, and Jordan controlled Judea Samaria, which they called the West Bank. Um, these are areas which some say should now form a state of Palestine. Obvious question is, why, when they had control, when the Arabs had control of these areas, was the no attempt to form a state of Palestine? Uh, again, that points to the conclusion that it's not about land, it's about fighting the Jews and trying to eliminate a Jewish state. Of course, it wasn't until recently that when you said the term Palestinian, it meant Jews. And you'll see here on the left, Arabs to boycott Palestinian goods. And on the right, Arabs invade Palestine. They were invading the Jews at the time. Now, one of the things that's driving the conflict, unfortunately, is various types of incitement. Uh, there is a financial incitement uh, the so-called pay for slay that the Palestinian Authority runs and the Martyrs Fund. Now, they make no secret of what the priority is. And I'm going to play a one-minute uh, video from Mohammed Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority, which indicates what his priority is financially. Hopefully that'll play. That no, didn't play. Try again. If it doesn't play, basically is saying that um, they will pay the terrorists, they will pay the prisoners, even if they only have one penny left, the priority is to go to uh, the payment of the terrorists. Now, Australia has been uh, unwittingly involved in this, and I want to thank uh, our other guest, Senator Erica Betts, who has been very, very helpful, um, particularly in Senate estimates committees, in asking for accountability of what's happening with Australian foreign aid. Um, this cover story of the Spectator magazine was part of our campaign to expose the nexus between Australian foreign aid and terrorism. You can probably see that there's a guy lying on the ground with a pool of blood. Uh, he's got a kippah with a Star of David on it. Stabbed into his back is an Australian $100 note. And the uh, 
uh, headline here is Aussie tax slayers. We were able to successfully demonstrate that Australian money was being used to pay terrorists to kill Jews in Israel. The Australian government uh, responded and they discontinued the cash grants to the Palestinian Authority. Um, this is one of our signature uh, policy wins and Senator Eric Betts certainly played a role in this. Another form of incitement uh, that occurs is the glorification uh, as heroes of prominent terrorists. Uh, Dalal Mugabe is uh, at sports festival, um, was one of the, uh, I, I guess, most well-known terrorists, uh, and particularly as a woman. Uh, here we have a sports festival in her name involving uh, a couple of schools. Um, she succeeded uh, with others, uh, suicide bombs, uh, blowing up a bus, uh, ending ki up killing 37 civilians, including 12 children, and wounding uh, 70. Now, that we have numerous, numerous examples of schools, of public squares, of um, other institutions being named after terrorists. This is a group of the kids that were killed on that particular bus. It goes further. Um, whole range of strategies. Uh, the religious quoting of uh, various uh, liturgy from Islam, that Jews are evil, uh, from the Quran, from the Hadiths. There is specifically a Hadith in the ha ha Hamas Charter to kill Jews. It's the one about um, Jews hiding behind rocks or trees and they will speak, uh, come and kill them. Uh, the brainwashing of children to be terrorists and martyrs. Uh, I mentioned the pay for slay program. Uh, there's almost $400 million a year that goes towards the payment of terrorists or their families. And the rate can be up to five times the salary that a teacher would earn. Uh, UNRWA is a major problem. Uh, parts of it are effectively controlled or influenced by Hamas. Hamas has full control of the teachers union in UNRWA schools and numerous examples of incitement in the textbooks that teach terrorism and anti-Semitism. And there's a whole propaganda of television shows, music videos, including children's shows that glorify terrorism. I, I could provide a couple of hours of, of examples uh, that confirm this. Another way that, frankly, um, the terrorism, the conflict is fueled is through certain international agencies. There is an NGO called UN Watch, which monitors uh, what the United Nations is doing. And the new session of the UN General Assembly began in September this year. In the previous year, you can see on the left there, the number of resolutions against various countries, um, the number against Israel exceed the total of the rest of the world combined. Uh, you'll notice none against China, despite its enormous uh, human rights abuses. And on the right hand side, um, over a longer period of time is a tally of the resolutions passed by the United Nations Human Rights Council. And again, it, it seems as if there's a complete obsession uh, in condemning Israel. And what does this do to those that want to attack Israel? It gives them legitimacy, it emboldens them, it gives them motivation. Now, most recently, in the last couple of days, I'm sure everyone's aware that there's a big environment, climate change type conference in Glasgow. So here is a march. And you will notice at the back of the march, the largest flags at the COP26 march are those are the so-called Palestinian flags. And they're chanting about freeing Palestine and from the river to the sea and the usual nonsense. Now, what this has to do with climate change 
um, you know, you have to be quite obsessed to go down this path. And yes, they are. Um, here is another one. Uh, Palestine is a climate issue, apparently. Well, I'll tell you what the one of the climate issues is. They burn thousands of tons of car tires and truck tires. There's a pile ready for burning. And they do that in order to create clouds of black smoke in order to hide the terrorists trying to go through the security fence uh, into Israel. Never been condemned by any environmental groups. You've got to ask yourself the question why. Now, this has come to Australia, unfortunately. And um, this is something we've been exposing in the last couple of weeks. Um, the line, O Allah, give us the necks of Jews, amen, entirely consistent with the sort of material I've been showing you, but this time it's on the streets of Sydney. Now, fortunately, we do have some laws in this country and we have filed formal legal complaints at both state and federal level um, to take on Hizbut Tahrir, who uh, held, on, held this rally and um, next year will be interesting as the matter proceeds. Now, I want, to I want to just conclude on a more optimistic note because it's not all black, it's not all dark. And in fact, over the last 15 months, 18 months, there's been a very, very positive development. And that's the Abraham Accords. Uh, the sort of attitudes that I've shown you uh, is not universal through the Arab world. We have seen uh, tremendous change and uh, normalization agreements have been entered into between Israel with the United Arab Emirates, with Bahrain, with Sudan, with Morocco, and there's a lot of speculation that there will be more. And recently, we had the privilege of hosting the UAE ambassador for one of our events, and we hope to do more um, with these sort of people. If they extend a hand of friendship, if they're prepared to recognize Israel as a Jewish state, we reciprocate enthusiastically. And uh, uh, this is a game changer. This is, this is really important. So Greg, thank you very much. Um, I hope that's given a bit of overview, a bit of understanding of some of the drivers and maybe a little bit of optimism at the end too. Thank you, David. Can you bear with it? Um, fascinating, David, because as you know, Australia's foundation is based on a Judeo-Christian uh, ethic. So it's very important that we understand the true nature of the conflict. May I pass over to Senator Erica Betts and uh, Senator, over to you for a brief commentary on how you see the situation in your role, and then we'll go into a Q&A session. Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much for having me. Family Voice is a force for good in Australia. Family, faith and freedom are fundamental ingredients for a healthy society. So Family Voice's concentration on these, fundamental, on these fundamentals displays its concern for a healthy Australian society. While some may say it takes a village to grow a child, there's no substitute for familial love. While some deride the existence or importance of a greater um, being, a lot of our mental health issues relate back to the lack of an anchor, lack of hope, or a being greater than oneself, namely faith. And freedom, a value for which millions have been willing to sacrifice their lives, is not a commodity which governments can trade. We have fundamental freedoms which belong to each one of us for the simple fact of us being humans. We may call them God-given, innate, fundamental human rights, rights recognised by UN charters or even bills of rights. But never forget, the rights enunciated by the UN and in bills of rights are just their enunciation. We have these rights full stop not because the UN says so, or a Bill of Rights says so, we have these inalienable rights because we are human. 
So in defending, upholding and advocating for the values of family, faith and freedom, Family Voice does you and me and every Australian a great service. So a very big thank you to Family Voice. And in case you haven't guessed it, I consider it a great honour to have been invited by Family Voice to address you this evening, especially to have been jointly billed with Dr David Adler, a man of intelligence and insight who combines a passion with professionalism. Don't know what happened then, but... Uh, I got the rapture, up, Senator. But, uh, mm. um, <laughs> uh, I think it was David Adler's modesty that uh, intervened, <laughs> but, but allowed me, uh, allow me to continue. Dr. David Adler is a man of um, intelligence and insight who combines a passion with professionalism to present as a formidable foe, or fortunately, in my case, a wonderful ally, and it's great to share the platform with uh, David. Tonight, we're asked to consider the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and its importance to our freedoms. Nobel Prizes for helping peace efforts in the Middle East seem to be relatively prevalent, with the circumstances dictating that not much actually changes. The historic roots of the conflict are well known and documented with people having all sorts of you butte resolutions, which never get adopted or don't work in practice or aren't acceptable. The two-state solution seems a sensible approach. Sure, there will be disputes as to the boundaries and fairness, but even more fundamental than such practical issues is the prerequisite that both, and I stress both parties, that is the two states, acknowledge the right of each other to exist. And without such a principled guarantee, no peace talks can commence, and in fact, nor should they. From an Australian perspective, having been so intimately involved in the establishment of the State of Israel and being the first country to cast a vote in favour of the State of Israel being created, mm. we as Australians have a sincere, long-standing interest in the success of Israel and her protection. For decades since her establishment and Israel has enjoyed bipartisan support from the body politic in Australia. Only fringe extremists from both the right and left of politics took an opposing view. Regrettably today, the left of mainstream Australian politics has begun shifting to an ugly anti-Israel and anti-Semitic sentiment. Be it support for the BDS, which is the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement, especially by the Australian Greens, the pro-Palestinian Palestinian state move without the need for there to be a commitment to the preservation of Israel is gaining some traction from people such as former Labor New South Wales Premier and Foreign Minister Bob Carr. These trends are concerning as was Australia's abstention on the UN vote on Palestinian recognition in 2012. Just recently, Labor's national platform, which is binding on Labor parliamentarians, requires a future Labor government to treat the issue of Palestine as an important priority, not the Middle East issue or the Israel-Palestine issue, but the Palestinian issue. The trend, ugly as it is, seems to be developing within the left of Australian politics. One suspects that with the influx of Muslim immigration and its numerical strength in parts of New South Wales especially, some deem a shift in policy as being politically advantageous. According to the ABS, Muslims make up about 2.6% of our population, that is some 600,000, who mainly live in the big cities. In comparison, the ABS identified, if I recall correctly, and David, correct me if I'm wrong, there are about 91,000 Australians who identify as Jewish by ancestry. One suspects the actual number is substantially higher because the answer to religion in the census is optional, and many Holocaust survivors and their close relatives 
and many more non-practicing Jews are believed to prefer not to disclose their religion. So the real number, probably maximum 250,000, probably less. But one assumes about half, if not even less than that, of the Muslim population. Those only interested in numbers and not principle, integrity and substance see an opportunity to jump the fence simply on the basis of numbers. One suspects and hopes the vast majority of Australian Muslims who genuinely seek lasting peace in the Middle East would nevertheless support a two-state solution. In recent times in Australia, there has been the adoption of, and this is on the positive side of things, the adoption of the, I'll get this right, International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism. Now, this alliance is an intergovernmental organisation uniting governments and experts to strengthen, advance and promote Holocaust education, remembrance and research worldwide. And uh, the government has now finally agreed to adopt the following, albeit non-legally binding, working definition of anti-Semitism and allow me to read it to you. It is Anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews which may be expressed as hatred toward Jews. Rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism are directed toward Jewish or non-Jewish individuals and or their property toward Jewish community institutions and religious facilities. And just in case you think it goes over the top, it also specifically says the criticism of Israel, similar to that levelled against any other country, cannot be regarded as anti-Semitic. But now this had been doing the rounds in the international community for some time. I asked the federal government at Senate estimates over a period of time whether it would be accepted here. Answer was no. The ABC's chief editor hadn't even heard of it when I asked him about it. Uh, he's still struggling as to whether to adopt it or not. But the good news is that recently the Prime Minister did announce that uh, the Australian government had now accepted uh, this definition of anti-Semitism. So that is, if you like, uh, on the positive side. And whilst there are many negatives to concentrate on, there are also the positives, like David said about the Abraham Accords, uh, fantastic news great legacy for Donald Trump, whatever you may have thought of him, uh, that is one of his legacies for which uh, he deserves a huge praise. I Israel is not surprisingly a beacon for democracy, rule of law and freedom in the Middle East. It's the only true democracy. It is modelled on, it won't surprise you, the Judeo-Christian ethic, which provides the pillars for our Western democracy in our civilization and in our way of life. Given that the Judeo-Christian ethic provides these pillars for us, we must recognize Israel as the geographic birthplace of our value system. Those opposed to our world-leading successful societal structures known as the Western system are also opposed to the country and people which govern the geographic birthplace of our value system. It's nearly like a litmus test in politics today. Ask someone, do you support the state of Israel's right to exist? And the answer will usually provide a defining insight into the rest of their political thinking. Or if you ask people about freedom, such as freedom of speech, freedom of association and religion, and the role of government intervention in our daily lives, you will find their answers will nearly always also define their attitude to Israel as well. It's an interesting observation and also a very telling one. While talking about things freedom, let me briefly turn to religious freedom, something which one country in the Middle East actually practices, and that is Israel. On Friday, I was part of an online group of coalition MPs with our Attorney General discussing the Religious Freedom Bill. Those of you who have heard me on this topic would be aware that my st uh, starting point is 
that the right to freedom of religion is in fact a subset of the overarching rights the freedom of speech and freedom of association. If the latter two, namely freedom of speech and freedom of association are protected, it stands to reason freedom of religion as of necessity would be protected as well. In short, I've lost that argument, uh, but I still believe it to be correct. What uh, government gives, and this is what concerns me, what government gives, one assumes government can also take away. And that's why I'm instinctively opposed to these so-called bill, rights bills. I expect legislation will be introduced uh, into the parliament uh, very shortly. The fact such legislation is needed is, I must say, exceedingly worrying. Unfortunately, freedom of religion around the world is declining. According to Pew Research, the decade 2007 to 2017 saw a marked increase of restrictions on religious rights around the world. And it's not only governments. So social hostility involving religion, including violence and harassment by private individuals, organisations or groups, have also markedly increased. This has been felt throughout the Western world and Australia as well. Teaching Catholic doctrine on marriage can see an archbishop being brought before a government body to explain himself. The legislation brought in uh, by a left-wing Labor government in Tasmania. And there's a Catholic father of seven who on becoming premier needed to be denigrated, including by a national broadcaster for his religion, um, as opposed to celebrating his capacities and why he was actually elected to lead the nation's most popular state. In Queensland and Tasmania, state sanctioned suicide needs to be administered even in facilities which were founded on the principle of preserving life, which is uh, opposed to uh, their practices and beliefs. Christian education will soon have its rights curtailed in relation to employment in Victoria. Let me sum up with uh, how I began. The role of family voice in protecting our family's faith and freedom has never been more important. The Judeo-Christian principles on which our society was founded are worthy of defending and protecting, and family voice does exactly that. As Thomas Sowell so succinctly said, freedom has cost too much blood and agony to be relinquished at the cheap price of rhetoric. Let's say that again, delete freedom, but insert Israel, and you will hear, Israel has cost too much blood and agony to be relinquished at the cheap price of rhetoric. Let's push back on the empty rhetoric and protect both Israel and our freedoms. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, um, Senator. Excellent summation and a great overview to the topic. David's going to ask some questions at the moment. I just want to kick off with uh, David Adler for a moment. Uh, David, as you know, look, I just want to declare I have no denominational interest uh, in any particular denomination. I mean, my, my mother was a Catholic. My father was a Protestant. My brother married a Jewish girl. Uh, I married an Anglican girl. I am truly non-denominational, i got to tell you. But I have to tell you also, David, that my parents came out from war-torn Hungary in 1957, and they saw a lot of Jewish persecution at the time. So I do have a very workable knowledge. David, why is there, and what value is there for the media to denigrate Israel as a state? Why do they want to pursue this? Um, Greg, thank you very much. It's, uh... I've spoken to a whole range of experts about that question. Um, we have seen, as you know, in our media, stray away from the sort of values that uh, Eric has attributed to mm. family voice. They've drifted away from family values. They've drifted away from Judeo-Christian mm. ethics. They've uh, embraced what is popularly known as woke causes. 
And a, a very perceptive commentator said to me one day that supporting Palestine is not based on facts. It's a state of mind. Uh, it's like a set. So the same group will support, will say there is a climate emergency. The same group will say abortion on demand. The same group will say same-sex marriage and gender fluidity. The same group will say euthanasia. The same group now says vaccine mandates. And then when you've got that whole set, um, you're opposing the, the cradle of the Judeo-Christian ethos where, where it all began, which is the Holy Land, the land of Israel. Yep. So um, it seems to come as a package, not based on facts, no. but it's, it's, it's almost like a, a false religion in itself. Okay, thank you, David. Over to David Deliver, please, for questions. Well, thank you, Greg. Uh, so the first question is for Senator Abetz. Uh, Senator, why do we not see vibrant democracies in the Middle East? Well, there's a very good question. Uh, there is the one vibrant democracy that uh, has elections on a very regular basis in recent times <laughs> uh, in Israel. Uh, but yeah, despite all the instability, a stable society. Um, why don't they have uh, democracy? I dare say because they have not been influenced by the same values of um, the Judeo-Christian ethic. And in fairness also, there is the Greek influence as well in our Western civilization that uh, I didn't mention this evening, uh, but part of this uh, democracy, individual liberty, that the individual uh, is the important person uh, in the whole equation and then the family unit. And of course, dictatorships hate people of faith. Mm. Why? Because in general terms, unless uh, you clothe yourself with that particular faith to justify the dictatorship, you will then have an authority that is higher than the state. And uh, yeah, if you're an Adolf Hitler or a Joseph Stalin or uh, in China or North Korea or Cuba, you cannot countenance the possibility that people will think that there is a higher authority to which they uh, might have to be uh, subservient. And so well, that then undermines. And uh, within the Middle East, uh, David, you might have a better perspective on this, quite frankly, than myself. Uh, I don't know, David, do you want to offer some commentary? Well, the, the culture is completely different. Mm. Um, and uh, they respect different things. I'm not saying inferior things, just different things. So for example, uh, strength earns respect. Uh, in Australia, in order to succeed in politics, some would say you need to be able to do deals, to negotiate, etc. In the Middle East, it's almost the reverse. That is a sign of weakness if you're coming to other people to mm. do deals and negotiate. So the people who get to the top um, are the strong men, uh, those who, who can rule with force. It's, it's just a completely different culture. David? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Greg. Uh, the Next question to Senator Roberts. Should the national curriculum give greater attention to the nation of Israel and to the mistreatment of the Jewish people throughout history? Uh, clearly, uh, it should. There, there is no doubt that uh, the, uh, Israel and its history is an important part uh, of our societal structure. Um, uh, just the other day, I was uh, reading in the uh, Old Testament in the five books of Moses about the difference between murder and manslaughter and the requirement for malice of forethought. Mm. And uh, malice of forethought was something I learned about in criminal law in, uh, in uh, my law degree, uh, I think in the second uh, criminal law lecture that I attended. So, yeah, the, the biblical influence on our culture is just huge. Mm. And... Uh, it should be part and parcel of our national curriculum. These days, it's pretty sad. If I were to, 
you know, say to a primary school class today, uh, or even high school, or chances are even a university class, that you would need the wisdom of Solomon to deal with that. They would ask, who on earth is Solomon? Never heard of him. And uh, that is quite frankly, a very concerning and frightening uh, development and an indication how our education system has failed us very badly. A question for Dr. Adler, the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement in Australia, is this growing or is it shrinking or is it static? Um, it's never really had much traction uh, in Australia in a practical sense, uh, not locally here. We had a problem with a Greens controlled council in Sydney, um, maybe 10, 12 years ago, Maracle Council, that adopted a BDS policy. And then when they understood what it meant in terms of the amount of technology that they would have to abandon and replace uh, and other practical things, uh, it was, as well as some political pressure, it was undone. Now, having said that, um, most American states have anti-BDS legislation, and we are seeing it used against Unilever, whose subsidiary uh, Ben & Jerry's ice cream uh, has decided in its wisdom that it will uh, boycott uh, Judea and Samaria. So even though it doesn't affect domestic things in the US, it has proved to be very useful uh, legislation. Now, I know that um, one of Senator Abetz's colleagues uh, did draft anti-BDS legislation for Australia. Um, it's sort of sitting in a bottom drawer somewhere and hasn't been implemented. But as we speak, um, BDS doesn't have much traction in Australia at all. Oh, well, that's good to hear. Uh, ben and Jerry, they sound like awfully Jewish names to me, but we'll leave that uh, Actually, to one you, side. You, no, you, you've, you've touched on an important sensitive issue, um, and it's one that's existed throughout the ages. Um, we have suffered from almost a, uh, a, a, clan, a cancer within our um, body politic, and there have been some extremist left-wing secular Jews who have attacked um, Jewish principles more vigorously and more dangerously than, than many others. They have to be called out just as much. Yeah. Uh, speaking about calling out, it seems to me that many of our Christian schools are being very quiet about threats to freedom of faith, hiring, freedom of expression. Are Jewish schools raising concerns about these issues in Australia? Uh, not enough. Um, Jewish schools haven't had a, a major problem. It's been more theoretical than, than practice, practical. But we, we have a number of our Jewish schools, for example, where the, uh, the principals are rabbis. So uh, Mount Scopus in Melbourne and uh, Mariah in Sydney, the largest Jewish schools in um, Melbourne and Sydney, have rabbis as their principals. So that's very useful in, in creating a standard and giving guidance. But um, we support uh, the sort of principles outlined by Senator Abetz and uh, his efforts to get them uh, embedded in the, uh, in the bill that's currently being drafted. Thank you. Another question for Senator Abetz. Uh, connections between Australia and Israel, are these understood in Australia or if not, how can that be strengthened? Um, not sure what's meant by the connections as in historical or at the moment, right, the, the historical connections. Once again, I think it's a uh, terrible uh, uh, denial to our children that these things are not taught in history, uh, in our education system should be part and parcel of the national curriculum. And uh, that that needs to be and should be highlighted uh, in especially Bathsheba, um, yeah, a great part of Australian history. Um, and nowadays, how many children are taught about the charge of the uh, Light Horse Brigade, etc.? Um, just people have shrugged their shoulders. 
they don't know what you're talking about. But that said, uh, the government is working hard in relation to its relationships with Israel, with uh, looking at free trade, et cetera, and uh, uh, technology exchanges. We are trying as much as we possibly can to uh, have exchanges uh, with Israel. And uh, for what it's worth, I just before the COVID break, break out, I was able to be in Israel on a, a trip and it's a great, great country. And after COVID's over, anybody that wants to should visit Israel, a fascinating country. Mm. Another question to you, Senator. Is there any update on the Holocaust Memorial in Tasmania? And has there been any pushback regarding that? Here's a very good question, and I will have to make a note um, uh, for myself to uh, follow that one up. <laughs> I, I'm sorry I can't uh, assist in that regard, but I hope it's underway. Mm. Perhaps, uh, Dr Adler, do you have a comment on the memorial in Tasmania? I, I'm like Senator uh, Abetz, I'm not across the detail of the progress at the moment. Okay, well, it's always good to stump the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the battle, well, isn't it? One good. more question, uh, David, please. Yeah, never one mind. more question. Uh, you've mentioned, uh, Dr Adler, uh, the connection of the name Palestine to Philistine. So should the term Palestine be used or not? Um, in its correct context, uh, there was a, Palestine is a geographic name. It's rather like saying Gippsland in Victoria or Blue Mountains in New South Wales. It's a regional name. It has never been a state. It has never been a country. It has never been a nation. It has never been a distinct uh, people. So in its correct context, it, it is a word. Um, the British had a mandate called the Mandate of Palestine, which was to administer a certain geographic area. So that's how it should be used. Okay. David, thank you very much. Um, we're going to have to end it there in fairness to our, uh, to our uh, people that have registered and in fairness to both of you. I, we said it was an hour. Can I just really say on behalf of the Governing Board of Family Voice, the membership nationally, uh, myself and David DeLima, look, thank you so much for coming and voicing your concern, but it's so good to hear voices of reason rather than voice of, voices that uh, tend to denigrate free speech, tend to denigrate faith, the family and freedom. So thank you very much. I'm going to ask David DeLima now, if you, if you don't mind, your closing prayer and then we'll do an official uh, good night. Thank you, David. Well, thank you, Greg. Let's pray once more. Creator of the universe, we give thanks for the mission you've given to the children of Abraham and to his covenant son, Isaac. And we thank you that other nations may gather and enjoy that light and connect in as friends of Abraham. And we thank you that Australia is so friendly towards Israel. And may that continue. So strengthen our relationship with Israel, we pray, so that together we may benefit the other nations of the world. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, David. Dr. David Adler, Shalom. Senator Eric Abetz, thank you so much. We look forward to having you again. On behalf of Family Voices Australia, good night and thank you so much for being our guest tonight. Good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>